I'm genuinely delighted to have this opportunity to talk about the Ballykindler internment camp. The word Ballykindler, the place Ballykindler, has been familiar to me since childhood, as I often hear my father tell the story of how his uncle Patrick was arrested in Arva by the Black and Tans and sent off to Ballykindler, where he was interned for almost a year, and how he was released from that place emaciated and quite ill. So naturally, I've always been interested in my granduncle and keen to learn more about that place where he and so many others, 2000 in all, suffered great privations. I'll say a little more about my personal connection towards the end. Through the years, it's always surprised me how Ballykinder has only seemed to warrant a, a passing a reference in the various published histories of the Irish War of Independence, despite the fact that the camp housed some of the great figures of that movement, people such as Dennis McCullough, uh, Pather Carney, who wrote Our Own Navian, our national anthem, Sean Lamas, who went on to be Taoiseach, and quite a number of TDs who were elected to the first stall. It was only with the publication of Liam O'Diver's History of the Camp, a wonderful book in 2013, that this lacuna has been filled. And I draw heavily on Liam O'Diver's research in describing the camp and describing conditions in the camp. A News Talk radio documentary in 2019 also helped to raise the profile of this half-remembered place. This lecture, if nothing else, will at least make some small contribution to keeping the memory of Ballykinder alive, and Cavan County Library are to be commended for including this topic in its War of Independence series. Ballykinder was an internment camp that operated in County Down from the late autumn of 1920 up until December of 1921. It was established by the British authorities to hold prisoners pending their being brought to trial. The massive roundup of suspect revolutionaries uh, throughout the country as the War of Independence progressed meant that the regular prisons were absolutely full to capacity and some other system was needed to house thousands of prisoners. The British solution was the establishment of internment camps. They had used them previously uh, during the Second Boer War from 1900 to 1902. And in time, the concept was adapted to respond to the changing and indeed the deteriorating uh, conditions in Ireland. An internment camp in Francoch in Wales housed almost 2,000 prisoners following the 1916 rebellion. So the template, it was already there, it was just waiting to be dusted down again. So as conditions deteriorated in Ireland in 1920, uh, the decision was made to establish the Ballykinder internment camp. Those incarcerated in Ballykinder, they weren't all IRA volunteers who were actively involved in the independence struggle. They also included political and civil figures, those suspected of being sympathetic to the Republican movement, and others who had no involvement at all, except that they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Ballykinder is situated approximately three miles from Dundrum village between Danpatrick and Newcastle in County Down. The 10 acre site that comprised the internment camp had formerly been used by the British Army as a summer training camp for the famous Ulster Division prior to the First World War. One of its strengths as a place to hold large numbers of prisoners was that three sides of the camp was bordered by the sea. So this made the escape from the camp more difficult and it made the site much more defendable. Its proximity to the sea made life very difficult for the prisoners, especially in the winter months, when they were exposed to the wind that blew the sand into their eyes and blew the sand into absolutely everything. A further difficulty was that the camp was at sea level and parts of it flooded during the winter. And of course, the sandy ground in the recreation area quickly turned into mud making living conditions absolutely atrocious. It was really quite a bleak spot. Ballykinder contained two camps, Camp 1 and Camp 2. 
And these two camps were divided by barbed wire fencing and no communication was allowed between both camps. The prisoners in each camp lived in what were called huts. Each camp held a maximum of 1,000 men. The men were separated into four companies of 250 men and each company was housed in 10 huts with 25 men living in each hut. There was also some communal buildings such as a chapel, a dining hall, a canteen and some workshops. Toilet facilities consisted only of a bucket and the prisoners were responsible for cleaning and they were responsible for all repairs within the camp. The prisoners viewed themselves naturally as being prisoners of war and they organised themselves within the camps along military lines with a commandant and junior officers in each of the two camps who were responsible for negotiating conditions with the camp authorities and ensuring that morale was kept up and that discipline was retained among the prisoners. So we're now going to take a further look at conditions in the camp. First of all, food. Well, the only and the last good meal that the prisoners had at Ballykindler was at Christmas of 1920. A great effort had gone into encouraging families to send gifts of turkeys and hams and other treats for the Christmas season. The British allowed some of the internees to cook a Christmas dinner, but it was all downhill after that. Prisoners were entitled to what were called a soldier's ration. And a soldier's ration consisted of a daily allowance of a pound of bread, 10 ounces of potatoes, four ounces of vegetables, two ounces of rice, a half ounce of tea, two ounces of oatmeal, a half ounce of sugar, a half pint of milk, 10 ounces of meat, and once a week, eight ounces of bacon and 12 ounces of fish. In reality, even these meagre provisions were not provided. The meat was a poor quality and really only fit for stewing. The milk provided was only sufficient to colour the prisoner's tea. The bacon was inedible. More than once, half the men fell ill from eating bad meat. By early February 1921, so many were sick that the daily roll call was suspended because the men were unable to appear on parade. The bread supplied to the men was often blue molded. The only consistently good food received by the men were rice and potatoes, but often there weren't enough of these to go around. All of this meant that the men were very reliant on food parcels from home and on what they could buy in the canteen themselves. A letter sent from the camp to G.V. Maloney, solicitor in Cavan, indicated that homemade cakes, butter, tea, sugar and milk were the most useful parcels. At times when tensions between the military and the prisoners were high, the authorities would often refuse to collect parcels from the nearby railway station. And when the parcels were eventually distributed, any food inside was gone off. Often the internees experienced semi-starvation. The prisoners could run what they called a canteen, but we might call it a shop. The canteen sold cigarettes, razors, toothbrushes and razors. The British authorities insisted that the stock in the canteen come from British suppliers, but the internees, they decided to buy Irish and they put in place a smuggling system that allowed them to get into the camp Irish products that were then sold at a reduced price unknown to the authorities. Of course, in time, the authorities discovered what was happening and tried to end it and a cat and mouse struggle ensued for the whole of 1921. The internees developed their own currency because they weren't allowed to have any real money in case they bribed the soldiers. Their actual money was confiscated on arrival at Ballykinder and they were issued with paper coupons instead, with small denominations printed on coloured paper and larger amounts printed on white. In September 1921, 
the camp commandant ordered the prisoners to hand in all their coupons. And he discovered that more coupons were handed in than had been issued in the first place. So the prisoners had mastered the art of forgery. The commandant refused to issue any more currency. But after much protest, the internees were allowed to create their own currency. And a Dublin-based printing company agreed to print the currency free of charge for the internees. A camp hospital was situated in number one camp and it was meant to uh, be there for uh, the prisoners in both camps but it only consisted of 40 beds and this proved to be inadequate to care for almost 2,000 prisoners living in such primitive and such difficult conditions. The hospital was not appropriately equipped nor was it suitable to deal with serious illness. And yet the authorities would never allow a seriously ill prisoner be taken from the camp to a proper hospital outside. Some men's physical and mental health collapse entirely under the strain of life in the camp. A small number lost their minds and fell into insanity. Morris Galvin, an internee from County Waterford, died due to inadequate medical treatment in Ballykinder. The 17-year-old's dead body was sent home to his mother. Some days later, she received a letter from the military authorities telling her to pay 34 pounds and four shillings the cost of conveying her dead son's body from Ballykindler home to Waterford. The spiritual lives of the men were looked after by a chaplain appointed by the Bishop of Down and Connor. Father John McLister was the official chaplain and he came to be assisted by Father Thomas Burbage from County Offaly, who was himself an internee. Mass was said each morning at 10 a.m. The rosary was recited each evening in the huts and confessions heard on Saturdays. It's extraordinary to note how religiously devout these young men were. For example, despite all that they had suffered already towards the end of their time in internment, the men of Camp 1 held the Loch Derg pilgrimage in the camp. They replicated the penitential activities a pilgrim might do at St Patrick's Purgatory in the camp itself. A branch of the St Vincent de Paul Society was established in the camp to look after internees whose families were unable to afford to send parcels. As individual visitation, which is one of the duties of St Vincent de Paul membership, it was impossible in the camp, members of the conference undertook spiritual works instead, such as adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and the distribution of religious books and articles to the internees. It was important for morale that the men be distracted from the terrible conditions that they lived in. So great score was put on education. Lessons were held in the Irish language, French, bookkeeping, shorthand and music. A library was formed and notices were placed in newspapers seeking donations of books. GAA and athletic competitions were held. Two serious incidents in the camps resulted in the shooting dead of two internees, Joseph Tormey and Patrick Sloan. Barbed wire fenced off the area between the two camps and the internees were forbidden to be within a certain distance of the wire separating both camps. The location of the British sentry post led to the sentry's view of a certain area between the camps being obscured and misunderstandings had led to shots being fired previously. On the 17th of January 1921, a similar incident occurred and two Westmeath men, Joseph Tormey and Patrick Sloan, were shot dead, although they had moved away from the wire fence. This and the way the aftermath of the incident was handled led to rising tension in both camps between the internees and the British military authorities. Questions were raised in the House of Commons, but the sentry was never called to account for his actions. And this was not to be the last such incident. In November 1921, several prisoners were being released from the camp. Some internees, including Tyke Barry from Cork, a member of the city council, were two yards from the fence, which they believed was permitted, 
and they were waving goodbye to their comrades who were leaving. A sentry ordered them to get back. The men initially refused, until one of their colleagues advised them to do as requested. As Tigbari moved away from the wire, he was shot dead by an 18-year-old British soldier. And this created huge anger both within the camp and outside the camp as the news uh, circulated around the country that Tig Barry was dead. Having described the camp and the camp conditions, we turn in particular to cabin connections to Ballykinder. According to Liam O'Dover's research, 67 cabin men were held in Ballykinder. In early December 1920, the anglo celt newspaper reported on a series of arrests that had taken place in the county at the end of November. Those arrested included the Mullah solicitor Justin McKenna and the Cornifane councillor Paul McShane. Father Fitzpatrick, a St Patrick's College priest, managed to get permission to say mass for the prisoners in the police barracks in Cavan before they were transferred to Ballykinder from the station in Cavan. On Sunday, the 5th of December, the prisoners, including P.A. Galligan, who was a county councillor, T.K. Walsh, who was a journalist based in Cavan, P. Smith, an auctioneer from Coothill, Roland Lynch, who was the secretary of the Cavan Workers' Council, M. Kenny, a native of Galway, M. Casey, a postman in Belturbet, Peter Connolly from Kilsilla, Balignà, Paul McShane, whom we have mentioned, County Councillor, native of Fane, and PJ Bartley McNugent, who was clerk of the Old Castle Union. These and others were transported to Ballykinder. At Christmas 1920, James Brady, who was a rate collector and an auctioneer from Lower Lavey, Matthew Smith, also from Lower Lavey, and Ernest MacDonnell from Virginia, were arrested and sent to the camp. Later in January of 1921, another county-wide roundup by the military took place, and among those sent to Ballykinder were James and William O'Donnell, who were coach builders, William Fay, who was a draper's assistant, all of them from Arva, Philip McCaffrey, who was from Castle Tara, E. Hart from Ballyhays Creamery, Pat Kiernan, a postman in Arva, William Boucher, a draper in Arva, Peter McGee, a shop assistant in Arva, Thomas Cullen, Thomas Brady, Pat McGoohan, Peter Connolly, Pat Sweeney, Dee O'Donnell, James Brady, all from Arva, John J. Coyle from Latnadronand, and John McKiernan from Crusher Law. The Cavan GA Convention, held in March 1921, heard a report that an athletics club had been formed at the camp, and the Cavan man Paul McShane was president of the club. The convention was asked to sponsor medals and other trophies to be awarded to the winners of the athletic competitions and the hurling and the football competitions that were due to be held in the camp. A subscription list was opened and sponsorship was received. A later news report on the sporting activities in Ballykinder reveal a wide spectrum of activities. Races of 100 yards to 120 yards, half mile, mile, slinging 56 pounds weights, pushing a 28 pounds weight, long jump, high jump, old men's race, football place kick, and for those of a more uh, cerebral kind, drafts and chess competitions. Cavan men featured among the medal winners in football, including E. MacDonald from Virginia, T. McTaggart, a Fermanagh man, but a former player with the Baltorbet Rory's, Dick Smith from Cavan and Hugh O'Reilly from Gauna. On the 5th of March 1921, 11 young men from the Butler's Bridge area were moved from Cavan Barracks to Ballykinder. Among the Butler's Bridge internees held in Ballykinder were two brothers, Michael and Jim McGarty from Inishmore in Butler's Bridge. PJ Dunn, in his history of Butler's Bridge, relates that Mick McGarty shared a hut in Ballykinder with John Lamas, the future Taoiseach. And on the 5th of July 1921, Sean Lamas wrote the following verse in McGarty's diary. It's easy to cry when you're beaten and die. It's easy to crawl, fish and crawl. 
But to fight and to fight when hope's out of sight, why that's the best game of them all. Cavan men were to be found not only among the prisoners, but also among the British soldiers who guarded them. Francis Duffy from Monaghan, in a detailed memo on Ballykinder that can be accessed on the Bureau of Military History website, described a complex relationship with a quartermaster sergeant called Farrell, who was a native of County Cavan. The IRA prisoners needed to communicate with headquarters in Dublin. Someone in the nearby village of Dundrum was willing to take and to send messages to and from and between Ballykinder and Dublin. A British soldier needed to be bribed to take the messages out of the camp. A Corporal Love had carried out this role for a very short time. He was replaced and after some time uh, Sergeant Farrell from County Cavan uh, came along and he had duties to perform in both camps and that made him an ideal uh, candidate uh, to be a messenger. And he very quickly built up a good rapport with the prisoners. And one of the Cavan prisoners recommended Farrell for the job of intermediary. So Farrell was sussed out and he agreed to take it on. So for almost 10 months, he was paid one pounds per week to carry dispatches. Over the course of time, the internees came to suspect that Farrell was in fact a British spy, a double agent. He seemed too eager to help and the relationship between him and the internees broke down. Following the truce of July 1921, a small number of prisoners were released over the following months on compassionate grounds, but the general release of prisoners didn't occur until December of 1921. When the treaty was signed, the British cabinet, following consultation with King George V, announced the release of all internees. The news reached Ballykinder on the following day, the 8th of December. The gates between the two compounds were opened and the prisoners were allowed to mix freely and a joyous atmosphere naturally ensued. The internees signed their names in each other's autograph books and diaries as a souvenir of their time together. A final mass was offered for both camps at 5am on Friday the 9th of December. The men gathered up their belongings and the gates were opened at 8am and they left the camp to walk the three miles to the nearest railway station where special trains had been laid on to take them to Dublin. All internees had to travel to Dublin first before making their way to their native areas. The men hadn't eaten since the previous day and at Newcastle station Locals met the train and provided them with much appreciated refreshments. Between Bally Ward and Catesbridge, County Down, the men suddenly realised that they were under fire. Loyalists had taken up positions along the route and opened fire on the train. Patrick Cahill from Cavan was among those injured by broken glass from a shot through the window of his carriage and his head and face were severely lacerated. When the train stopped at Catesbridge station, the men turned on the driver, fearing that the driver was going to abandon the train and leave the men to be ambushed. The driver revealed that he had heard that there was a plan to ambush the train at the next stop at Banbridge. He was ordered to drive through Banbridge at top speed, but as that was not possible, it was agreed that the train would only stop in Banbridge station for two or three minutes and this instruction was wired ahead to Banbridge Station. An armed loyalist mob of several hundred had stormed the platform at Banbridge and they attacked the carriage with stones and bricks, breaking the windows and attempting to gain entry. The men on the train held against them. And due to the crowd surging forward, the gunmen weren't able to open fire on the prisoners and the train began to move again and no lives were lost. A warmer welcome greeted the men as they moved former, further south, as they passed into Louth, Meath, and onwards 
to their destination, Amien Street in Dublin. The Cavan prisoners arrived in Cavan Town on the afternoon and the evening of Friday the 9th of December 1921. A holiday was proclaimed in the town. Sinn Féin flags flew from the windows of the buildings. Members of the volunteers, come in the morn, the Sinn Féin club and the labour union assembled at the town hall, which was festooned with a banner proclaiming, welcome to the felons of our land. At 1 p.m. they processed to the train station to await the first train load of prisoners who were greeted by the crowd with a deafening cheer. It was reported that the prisoners wearing camp attire and carrying bulky parcels looked remarkably fit after spending 12 months behind barbed wire. They processed back to the hall and then the men were paraded around the town led by the Upper Lavi Fife and Drum Band and the Drumcraft Band. Speeches were made and James Brady from Lavi and Eugene Smith from Cavan responded to the speeches with Smith speaking in the Irish that he had learnt at Ballykinder. That evening at half six, the prisoners from Kittishandra and Carrigallan arrived by train. The Butler's Bridge Band provided the entertainment, candles were placed in windows throughout the town and tar barrels were lit outside. The celebrations, they continued all weekend. A reception was held on the Sunday night for the Lavi prisoners in the Lavi Sinn Féin Hall, and similar scenes were played out in Kilishandra and Arva. A tangible surviving legacy of Ballykinder, as we draw towards the conclusion of this talk, is the treasure trove of documentation held in the National Library in Dublin that includes drawings, doodles, verse, diaries and autograph books belonging to some of the internees. And much of this can now be accessed online, including some very beautiful drawings and writings by one internee, Joe Considine from County Clare. And I encourage those interested in learning more about Ballykinder to go and view that online collection. As mentioned at the outset, my granduncle Patrick McGowan was one of the men behind the wire at Ballykinder. He, Peter Connolly, and other members of the volunteers were rounded up in Arva in November of 1920. And throughout his internment, his mother sent him food parcels. And once in the middle of a pot of jam, she hid a threepenny bit. And during his incarceration, uh, Patrick transformed the coin into a ring, which he gave to his mother, my great-grandmother, which remains a prized family possession. In fact, this is the ring here, and uh, we're very pleased that it has survived for almost 100 years. I'm glad to have it here with me as I give this lecture because I wear it to honour him and the other 2,000 who forfeited their freedom so that our country might be free. Once the celebrations were finished, there came, of course, the hangover. Quickly, the country, as we know, plunged into a bitter civil war. Friends became enemies. The story goes that my granduncle was asked to take part in an action against a former comrade. He refused and he had to flee. My grandfather, who was age 14, accompanied his brother to Queenstown, or Cove, as we call it now in Cork, where he took the boat for New York, vowing to never set foot on Irish soil again. He never came home, but his is just one of 2,000 different stories. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I want to thank you for watching.